can get up and dance with me if you want. Houston, Texas, how are you guys? I was, uh, well, uh, this is where I arrived. This is where it all started. It is not where I was born. It is, however, uh, where I was conceived. My parents, it is. My parents shook their Caucasian groove thing when they were 21 years old. And a lot of people say, how is it that your parents were able to have you that young? And the answer is fairly simple. They were both genuinely fond of intercourse. <laughs> so I was born nine months after that night in Dallas, Texas in 1959. And by the age of 11, I had decided to become an actor. My mom, God bless her, and she's actually watching from Dallas today. I love you, Mom. She is watching, and she did a wonderful thing for me. She took me to see a play at the Dallas Theater Center with my brother Brian. We went to see Charles Dickens' play, A Christmas Carol. And the play was wonderful, and at intermission, I looked to her, and I sounded just like this. I had this precious little Northeast Texas accent. I whistled on my asses. You hear that little ass whistle? So I turned to her, and I said, could, could, could I do that? That would be so much fun to be in, in plays and so forth. And she enrolled me immediately uh, a couple of weeks later. And I started training. And by the time I was 15, I was doing television commercials, scored a lead in a feature film by the time I was 16. And when I was 17, I was traveling around the country in a limousine signing pictures and kissing women and, frankly, deciding that that was a lifestyle that worked for me. Uh, I had no problem with that at all. There was nothing about that year that pissed me off. Nothing. <laughs> I went back and finished high school and moved to L.A. at age 18 and had been out there for, I've been out there for a very, very long time. L.A. has been extremely kind to me. Now, I have been a speaker for 32 years. I have never named a talk. But Ted wanted me to do this, and in fact, Eric Swanson, Eric, if you're watching, thank you. I spoke at Eric's event in Dallas a few months ago, and he said, do you think you're ready to do a TED Talk? And I said, that's easy, dude. And then I went, wait a minute. That's easy, dude. That's it. <laughs> and it, it, it just jumped out of my mouth. I thought, well, there it is. So here I am. Uh, I started training actors shortly after I got into the business in L.A. because I always was at ease in front of people. I was always at ease in a room going in front of directors and casting directors and writers and so forth, producers, executive producers. And as I said, every dream I ever had has been realized. And I'm kind of on gravy time now. But years ago, I discovered that I enjoy being a speaker more than I enjoy anything else and being a teacher right along with that. Speaker, teacher, same thing. And my primary attraction to it is because I'm up here saying my words and not a writer's words. I'm still active as an actor. I just finished a series created by Jim Carrey called I'm Dying Up Here. I don't know if any of you watch it on Showtime. It's a wonderful show. Uh, but most people know me best for my seven-year run as Aaron Pierce on the series 24, Fox's series, which was uh, a wonderful thing. But specifically, when they asked me to name my talk today, what did I call it? Whispers and Boomerangs. So I want to clarify what I mean by that. Every one of us have whispers. There is no doubt about that. That whisper is that beautiful voice within, and its job is to know. It doesn't think. It doesn't theorize. It knows. And it is there to help us. There is no other reason. Now, why we behave this way, especially in this country, and I have no business speaking about other countries because I'm not from there. I grew up in the U.S., I'm honored to live here, but one of the sad things that seems to happen is we have our beauty, our awareness, our connection with life itself domesticated right out of us, and we have to go back to the day of our birth, that precious day, e even further back, even back to our conception, which for me was here in Houston, because on that day, I, like you, outswam, and here's the actual math, approximately 500 million other candidates in order to be here in the first place. So what I'm sharing with you is that none of you need to study to learn how to be winners. It's your very nature. It's your nature. 
right? Against all odds. In fact, against uh, math that you will never be asked to fight again. So it started there. It started with the most intimidating math you will ever face, and yet you won. And you won because you weren't intimidated by math. In fact, the math that day wasn't even a concern for you. And you wound up getting here, and you arrived on the day of your birth in the winner's circle, and you were awarded a trophy for that victory. And that trophy is the very body in which you reside. I can't encourage you enough to take care of it. Love it. It's the only one you'll have in this lifetime. I read a survey many years ago that changed my life, and it was a survey of 100 hospice patients who were asked what their five biggest regrets were. And without going over each one of the regrets, I'll just tell you that the attention-getting moment for me was when I realized that 97% of them shared the same number one. And obviously, it was language differently in, in each instance. But basically, what they were saying was this. Here it is. It's time for eminent departure. And what they said is that they regretted that they had spent the entirety of their lives devoted to living the life they thought someone else wanted them to live. Mmm is right. I heard the collective mmm. And that's the effect it has on us. So I can't encourage you enough because none of you appear to be scheduled to leave this week at least. We never know. Some of us might not make it through the end of the day. We never know. But it seems like most everyone's going to be here for a little while longer anyway. I can't encourage enough the implementation of that attitude now. In other words, don't base your life on what your spouse thinks, your mother thinks, your, your minister thinks, uh, 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 what I want to say, society itself, really, but rather check in with the deepest yearnings of your soul, and that's where whispers occur. I have had so many whispers in my life that I've honored, and I've done studies on this, We're just in my own. My studies aren't to go to books. My studies are to just ke connect to the within. And as I study the whisper, it occurs to me that the two primary reasons that people veto their whispers, one, it doesn't seem to make sense. Please stop doing that. Please stop insisting that your whispers make sense. Trust them. Follow them. They will make sense in time. As they say in the 12-step programs, more will be revealed. Trust that. It makes sense that you're being whispered to the way you are. If you get to a stoplight, normally you would turn left to go home, but something is telling you to turn right. Please honor that turn right. You are being watched over. You are being protected. I have had whispers that have saved my physical life on three occasions. If this were not an 18-minute talk, I would tell you about each one of them. It's really, really powerful. So honor those whispers to the nth degree. I had a whisper that I should become an actor, so I did. And it's gone on to make tremendous sense. Boomerang simply references what we do every day, energetically speaking, what we throw into the sky. And for me, the only thing worth throwing into the sky is love. Love. And to do so with excellence and place your signature on it and throw it into the sky, meaning every conscious contribution you're making to life, hurl it into the sky with trust, in the spirit of trust that knowing that it is on a boomerang and boomerangs do not need our precious micromanagement. They know exactly what to do. It is their very nature to return, and they do in droves. So hurl as many of them as you can into the sky. Plant as many crops as you can and watch, because if one or two of your crops have a bad year, it's not a problem. It's not a problem because you've planted so much. It's harvest season year-round. Random thought. I loved what Jason did up here earlier today for this specific reason. The deck, the deck appears to have been stacked against him where he would say, well, what is the longest shot for you to ever do, become a professional speaker? And he went, yeah, so what's your point? And went ahead and did it. Jim Abbott, one-handed pitcher for the California Angels back when they were called the California Angels. And he became a pitcher, not just a baseball player. Spud Webb in the NBA, same idea. Spud looks in the mirror and says, I see an NBA player, despite the protestations of everyone else. Arnold Schwarzenegger, when we were doing a movie together last year called Aftermath, told me, Glenn, I learned years ago to ignore the naysayers. Now, since I was born right here in Texas, I want to tell you some of the stuff that I find funny about Texas, and specifically an article that my buddy Ron Schock read in the Houston Chronicle. God rest his soul, Ronnie, I miss you. Ronnie grew up here, very successful stand-up comic, and, and Ronnie sounded just like this. He got a deep old bass voice and 
deep southern voice, and he said, Glenn, I don't believe this nonsense. He said, I'm reading an article that talks about a train, a train that is rolling down the track. It jumps off, derails, goes up over the embankment, and plows through the back end of a Ramada Inn where they are having a wedding celebration. And the train hits 25 people, injures 20 of them, kills five. And the Houston Chronicle reported the incident this way, and I quote, It appeared that most of the guests were caught by surprise. Most of them. <laughs> not, 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 not all of them. Most of them. Which would lead me to believe that somebody must have been expecting it. <laughs> somebody must have gotten up that morning and turned to their beloved and said, You know what, Myrtle? I wouldn't be a bit damn surprised if a locomotive doesn't run over our butts today. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you something. If while I'm standing here today... A train is to come plowing through that back wall. You're going to see me poop my shorts right in front of you. If a train coming through a ballroom wall does not surprise you, you are one difficult son of a gun to impress. Let me tell you another quick one I got from the news. This one comes from the Miami Herald. I was down there doing a show called Bloodline for Netflix. We have any Bloodline fans out there? Okay, well, if you, if you need to learn about drug dealing, we are your show. And I went straight from playing the do-gooder of the world, Aaron Pierce, into playing a guy who traffics cocaine and makes people go away permanently. That's what I do. So I was down there and read an article about, well, the, the title, the article said, and it caught my eye, it said, Man killed by duck. Man killed by duck. Brothers and sisters, do you know that the number of people on planet Earth who have been killed by a duck is still in single digits? <laughs> I got to read this. So I start reading, and here's what it had to say. Apparently, there was a gentleman who was cruising down a waterway on a jet ski, you know, wang, 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 and here comes this low-flying duck. Now, if you've ever seen one of these, these low-flying geese or so that have their head way out, man, and their butts out, man, they are, they are bringing it, Jim. They are just bringing and then, bam, hits him right smack dab in the middle of the forehead, kills the man, and kills the duck. Now, my dear friends, I have spent my entire life believing that we die on the day we're supposed to die. And if that's true, it does beg the question, and I couldn't help but wonder, how many ways did God miss that guy that day before getting down to the duck option. That was my first thought. My second thought was, did his friend who was videotaping the incident, did it occur to his friend at any point to say, duck? And my third, my third thought was, Oh, hell, maybe it was the duck's day to die. <laughs> so I, uh, I've done so many different talk shows. I had the privilege of, of being on the Jimmy Kimmel Live show two weeks ago. But I've done so many different radio shows. We used to kind of cross-pollinate with American Idol on Fox uh, 24 every year. And we would go from one station to the next. Just brrr, it was like media day. And we did hundreds and hundreds of these interviews. And I was asked about my public speaking. I teach a program called The Extra Mile, which is about really just living in celebration. Right? We're either down here enduring or we're down here celebrating. And it is your option. 
It is your choice. We've been shown time and time again you can overcome anything. And for the record, if your pattern has been to complain, please stop that nonsense today. And here's why. If you think about this, and bear with me, and I know this is going to rub some of you the wrong way initially, but if you'll stay with me, you'll see the blessing in this. Everyone you have ever met was there to help you. It's the truth. Now you say, well, you just don't know. You just don't know. Right? The truth is, here's how I can prove that, because even the people you didn't care for, even the people you've held on to resentment toward, everyone who has ever crossed your path has helped you, and here's how, because they either showed you exactly how to live life or exactly how not to, in which case your previously regarded enemies have helped you immeasurably by showing you exactly how not to do it. God knows I've met a number of examples where I was able to look at them and instead of becoming embittered, was able to look and go, you know what, thanks for showing me that because I don't need to go down that path, because I was just on the receiving end of your behavior, and I never want to put someone else on the receiving end of what it is I am feeling right now. Thank you. So that's, uh, that's a whole reframing that will help a lot of you. Dr. David Hawkins sums up life this way. He says that every choice, every thought, every action we take does one of two things. It's so simple. It either contributes to or contaminates. It's that simple. And so if we wonder why it is we're feeling the way we're feeling, put your life on paper, dare to be rigorously honest, and write down the contributions you make to your own life. What are the things you do that you feel fantastic about? Dancing, by the way, is one of those for me. Here's another big one, eye contact. If you have people, Bob Dinell showed us eye contact this morning, I practice eye contact regularly, but if you find someone in your life who not only will engage you at the level of deep eye contact, but they will hold it and maintain that, cherish, cherish those people. It's so important to do that. So contribution and contamination. What are you doing to contaminate your life? What are you doing that your body doesn't like? What, what job are you doing that you can't stand? It's eroding your soul, right? We're down here to satisfy the deepest yearnings of our soul. That's why we breathe air. So I want to ask you this one question in closing, and feel free to shout at me on Facebook, look me up. I teach in three cities every week, Dallas, Los Angeles, and Salt Lake City. I have my own studio in all three cities, and I fly to them all the time. So here's my closing question for you. You had something in mind during that initial swim. You were here to express, not impress. So my question to you today is simply this. Why did you swim so fast? And whatever you come up with, go do it. Thank you.